Good afternoon, I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the enormous privilege of serving as president of Hunter College, the place where on campus or on Zoom, the American dream has been coming true for 150 years. We may not be able to celebrate our 150th anniversary in person, but it is a pleasure to welcome you to another edition of our exciting new online series, Hunter at Home, featuring our faculty stars and some very special guests in two important categories of lectures and conversations. Some Hunter at Home programs are designed to engage us with the life and death issues unleashed by the COVID-19 crisis, but others are meant to offer welcome relief from the pressures and anxieties we are all living with every day in isolation from our friends, colleagues, and families. For example, we've already presented illuminating programs on food security, health anxieties, and economic and social disparity. But we've also featured talks on Van Gogh and the Beatles, not the insects, but John, Paul, George, and Ringo. But actually, we will cover animals next month in two fascinating programs, one on talking to dolphins and the other on elephant intelligence. Please tune in. Our goal is to both inform and enlighten, to widen horizons with the kind of programming that makes social distancing and seclusion a bit more bearable. And we trust that we are keeping our community, our alumni, donors, and friends connected to each other and connected to us during this time of remote learning and living. Before I introduce this afternoon's program, I want to thank those of you who have donated so generously to help our Hunter students get through this crisis. Our Hunter Coronavirus Emergency Assistance Fund has been helping students pay for basic necessities such as rent and food during the crisis. And Hunter's Summer 2020 Scholarship Fund will enable students to continue their schooling this summer. So many of our students have lost their summer internships, jobs, and all sources of income. But with your support, they will not lose the progress they can make towards the finish line of their Hunter Diploma. So thank you. Today, we have a special program on a topic that is too important to ignore or postpone, even during a pandemic. How COVID-19 will impact on the future of urban life in both the immediate and distant future. After all, many of the advantages we've long cherished about our beloved city, the density, the constant interaction, and the easy access to mass transit, theater, and sports arenas now loom as impediments and create barriers to resuming life here as we knew it once the pandemic eases. Add to this the ongoing threat of climate change and the danger of postponing our day of climate reckoning while we try and regroup from the coronavirus. Does that vital issue get addressed now as we rebuild and reconceive our way of life? Or do we kick the can down the road at our own peril? On a related theme, should we envision the new New York with future pandemics in mind or treat COVID as a horrendous one-off and simply return to business as usual? These are just a few of the critical questions which experts are struggling to assess even as we gear up to op reopen the city sector by sector. Today, we are honored to welcome some especially gifted experts to conduct that discussion with our Hunter at Home audience. Thank you to our Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute and our Jonathan Fountain Director, Harold Hoser, for conceiving and organizing this important program today. Let me introduce the participants. From our own Hunter faculty, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Peter Marcatulio, a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Science, who currently serves as director of Hunter's Institute for Sustainable Cities. Joining Peter is professor of geography, Mark Pelling, who is a lead author on a recent intergovernmental report on managing the risk of extreme events and disasters as they impact climate change. Welcome also to Hunter Professor Lily Baum Pollins, the Urban Policy and Planning Department at Hunter, whose work focuses on sustainability, infrastructure, and environmental justice. We're delighted to welcome two guest commentators to the panel, Shlomo Angel, known as Sali, Professor of City Planning at the Marin Institute, and a specialist in documenting urban expression in the developing world. 
and Kizzy Charles Guzman, who works for the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. And resiliency is just what our Hunter community is all about. Thank you all for staying positive, staying involved, tuning in, and joining us to hear this amazing panel as it considers what New York's new normal might look like. Today's moderator is the truly extraordinary Bill Selecki, who wears many hats here at Hunter College, Director Emeritus of the Institute for Sustainable Cities, Professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Science, and Chair of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Programs Faculty Committee. Bill is a passionate advocate for sustainability and a leading voice locally as well as globally for rescuing our city and our planet from fatal climate change. Bill, thank you for all the work you do and thank you for bringing this program to Roosevelt House and to Hunter at Home. Please everyone enjoy the program. We thank you to your audience for being here. And of course, we look forward to the day when we will again welcome all of you back to our campus in person. Meanwhile, we remain connected through Hunter at Home. Bill, let me turn the program over to you and thank you again. I think it's important to sort of recognize as we think about the connection between cities and climate change and this pandemic, that the planet is in fact an urban planet, meaning that the vast majority or increasing a, a percentage of, of majority of people live in cities. The global population is about 7.8 billion. Right now about 4.4 billion of those people live in cities, uh, both large and, and, and small. And it's projected that, that much of the population growth that we'll see over the next couple of decades as we attempt to address the question of climate change will be in urban places. And so this sort of brings up this kind of question as to how does the COVID-19 um, outbreak, which has raised many questions regarding the livability of cities, the densities of cities, cities as, as nodes of, of, of transit and sort of uh, transport of, of disease vectors have emerged. And so what I want to do is sort of just say a couple of few more points regarding that connection between cities and um, uh, cities and climate change and COVID and then bring forward the panel. So one of the things that we recognize is that the, the outbreak has changed how we sort of imagine ourselves and imagine our cities. Um, the lower image to the lower right is that same gate just a few weeks ago after significant shutdowns of economic activity, the skies cleared. It's one of these sort of odd kind of almost celebratory elements of, of this moment to sort of look out at blue sky. And we also recognize the estimates are somewhere around given the current conditions that we might have a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions of somewhere between six or maybe as much as eight percent of percentage uh, projection I saw just this morning when we thought we would increase our emissions uh, level by one percent for the, uh, this year. Of course this sounds significant and of course it's under duress that this condition has has emerged but we recognize in order to achieve the 1.5 uh, degree goal uh, specified by the UN Paris Agreement that we'll need to do that multiple times, um, um, uh, you know, almost on a yearly basis as we stretch toward the 20, uh, 2030s and into the 2040s if we're gonna reach that goal. So the question is, how do we even sort of imagine that? And with that, I, I just wanted to kind of highlight a couple of points to reflect on um, as we think about COVID-19 and the connection to climate change. I've been doing some review and I think this, it's important to sort of, as a, as a framing, think about the connections. In some cases, People, people see the outbreak as, as a warning, that there's an instability, that there's a, that there's a, a disjunct between uh, the physical, natural world and the human world in which, um, which we've created as cities. Um, we also sort of recognize that it's brought up uh, very fundamental questions of inequity um, and, and, and mistrust of governance, which has limited our capacity to act. We also see this outbreak as a, as a lesson, that it's not only you know, how can we understand things that are coming at us? Can we see the risks that are emerging? Um, and, and the question is, can we see that larger, uh, more in, in some ways fundamental risk of climate change with clarity? Uh, in many cases, we've, we've missed this, this threat as it's literally uh, come upon us. Um, what does that say about our capacity to think about climate change? Also, we see it as example, um, that we can change rapidly. We have, we have moved very quickly into, uh, into a whole different type of, of lifestyle. 
in these past uh, months and, and weeks, um, in some cases more, 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 more uh, specifically. But also it's as, as a challenge that maybe we can't act, um, we can act quickly, but can we act enough to respond to some of these threats? Um, and, and what are the, the, the tension points that emerge? We also see it as this call to action um, and the connection that we need to make between science and public policy. In some cases, that connection has been ruptured. There's a mistrust. There's a questioning of science. And in some ways, this, this issue has been brought back up again in, in this moment of crisis. The last thing also, we see it as a great potential moment of opportunity to introduce, to reflect on, to think about new ways of connecting or reconnecting with the physical world to bring forward agendas that might promote um, advances in climate change. And of course, um, the Green New Deal as concept is just one of those clear examples. The last point I'd like to make um, as we sort of move forward um, is this idea of pause or not pause. So much of the discussion and so much of the lives in which we live, people sort of describe as a pause. Things are, are sort of, you know, stopped. Um, but I think it's important to remember that, um, that that's really not been the case in many ways. Um, that there are certainly those, those individuals who have had to sort of move forward into the breach um, and address these issues head on. And of course, the, the medical uh, uh, staff and technicians and, and all and the people associated with the healthcare industry are one, but there are many others. So I think it's important to recognize that as part of this, that there is not a pause. The other thing to sort of think about is that where has this struggle really taken place? And where is it really had and have not been a pause? Well, most of the, the challenge, most of the death, illness, and grief from this outbreak has occurred in cities. Uh, at least as it's currently, um, as the numbers currently reflect. But I think the critical thing which the panel will talk about and reflect on, at least sort of um, implicitly, implicitly, if not explicitly, why is this crisis sort of uh, presented in some cities more than in others? What is it about those cities? What are the qualities about those cities, maybe both a physical as well as organizational, uh, societal, that helps us understand these sorts of um, these these distinctions. So yes, in some ways there has been a pause. Many of us are sitting at our at our homes, trying to carry out our, our daily lives, working as well as we can, and and interacting um, with those around us to make make that daily life uh, take place. But I think it's also critical to recognize that this is a moment of intense work, and and sacrifice um, that that people are, are are bringing forward. And I think also it's during these moments of pause that we can get a lot done, we can get a lot of work done. And in fact, these are moments when new ideas emerge and where new ideas are brought forward. And I think um, in some ways, the, the essence of this panel is to sort of provide one of those vehicles to bring up ideas about urbanization, about cities in the context of COVID and climate change, to communicate those to um, you all, the audience, and then to extend beyond and to test notions and to, be, and to debate. And this in turn will become part of our path forward with respect to um, uh, moving beyond the current crisis and trying to sort of integrate our, our best work and understanding about how to approach both pandemics, health threats, um, and of course, this larger question of climate change. So I really, again, want to honor um, all the panelists, uh, thanking um, Jennifer Rabb for bringing forward her comments. Also, certainly the, the folks at Roosevelt House, specifically Shama um, Vent Ketsmar, who's uh, been helping kind of organize many of these um, uh, uh, policy discussions. And I think this one will, will help spark and forward a lot of other conversations about cities and the role of cities in this sort of fulcrum this tension point between responding to, to uh, pandemics, health threats, and the larger looming question of climate change. So I'm really excited to hear what the panelists have to say. Just as a quick run of show, each panelist will speak for about five minutes without um, one after the other. Um, no questions in between. Then we'll open it up for a few questions between each of the panelists to, uh, for clarification or for augmentation as needed. And then really the important part of this dialogue is to bring it out open to, to the audience. And we'll do this in a moderated uh, format with questions 
being being brought forward and then posed to the audience and uh, sorry being posed to the panelists and then we'll return back for a couple of closing comments so with that I want to turn um, just in a moment to our first um, panelists we'll have uh, four in sequence of our first will be Sully Angel then we'll have Lily Pollins um, then Mark Pelling um, and then uh, Kizzy Charles Guzman so I'm really excited to hear how they sort of bring forward our, their thoughts and help engage in this crucial discussion. So Sully, maybe we can turn first to you for about five minutes of, of reflection. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let me start by noting that uh, blaming cities for much of what is wrong with our world and now blaming cities for the quick spread of the current pandemic should come as no surprise. The anti-urban outlook with us since the time of Jefferson, not to mention Marx and Mao, is alive and kicking. And in the US, it has recently been politicized as well as our cities, more educated, more diverse, more globalized, and hence more liberal, remain the anathema of right-wing American first reactionaries. That said, the great wealth of nations, their productive capacity, their innovative thrust, their social, economic, scientific, medical, and cultural revolutions have all emerged in our cities. Our cities, vulnerable as they've always been to pandemics, are great engines of progress. To wit, the 10 US metropolitan areas with the largest numbers of reported cases, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Boston, Washington, Philadelphia, Atlanta, Miami, Detroit, and New Orleans account for no less than 29% of the US gross domestic product. The productivity of these great cities comes about because they bring millions of people closer to each other, making it possible for them to think together and work together as one integrated whole. As a result of that increased proximity, urban areas, be they central cities or their rings of suburbs, are much denser than rural areas. Indeed, we can define the great wave of urbanization that started in earnest at the beginning of the 19th century as the gradual movement of more and more of us from being closer to the land to being closer to each other. The social distancing agenda that agenda that now keeps us apart from each other has been very successful in slowing down the spread of the virus. In fact, more than one third of US metropolitan areas, New York among them, are now already 14 days or more beyond their peak of reported new infections. This has led some of us to view social distancing as the new normal, questioning the viability of cities in general and their high densities in particular. High density, they claim, is now proven to be unsustainable, and if so, we must now plan our cities with lower densities in mind. This is a sad misunderstanding of the prime objective of social distancing, flattening the curve, namely slowing down the rate of infection so as not to overwhelm our healthcare system. We now know that the virus will be with us until we're vaccinated or until we attain herd immunity. It is not going away. Yes, we need to protect vulnerable people. Yes, we need to isolate the sick. Yes, we need to learn how to weather this storm without losing our heads. And yes, this too shall pass. The ingenuity, the productivity, and the self-organization of our cities have rendered them resilient. Cities, and New York chief among them, are the epicenters of the creative spirit that keeps them alive and thriving. They have been pronounced dead before at regular intervals, it seems, and like the legendary phoenix, they've come back to life again and again. I strongly believe that social distancing teaches us nothing about the long-term viability of cities or for that matter of high urban densities. High urban densities remain viable and will remain viable for generations to come. What I do worry about is the long-term damage that social distancing is likely to do in the next two years to critical parts of our urban system. I am most worried about the devastation now being visited upon our public transit system, for example. Our public transit system is in a symbolic, symbiotic relationship with high urban density. To make it makes high density living and working viable, and it is in turn made viable by high density living and working. 
It is also the most vulnerable part of our cities to the pandemic because it brings so many strangers, millions of them in some places, into close proximity to each other. And it is now operating because it has to, to get essential workers to their jobs at a great loss, threatened with bankruptcy yet again. It will need to be revived, and I worry that it will not be able to muster the public support it needs for its revival, not to mention its future expansion. This is indeed a cause for concern because the promotion of public transit is a key element of our climate change agenda. Weakening political support for it will be detrimental to our ability to limit greenhouse gas emissions from transport in cities. That said, the beautiful picture of clear skies in cities everywhere, from New Delhi as you showed to Los Angeles, send a powerful message. Fewer cars on the road run by fossil fuels mean cleaner air and fewer greenhouse gas emissions. It is therefore of us to see a picture is worth a thousand words. Whether this picture can be translated into political support for increasing investment in public transport or in electric vehicles running on green energy in the years to come depends on our ability, on our ability to seize the moment. I, for one, remain hopeful that we can and that we will. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sully. We'll move on to our next panelist, as we mentioned. Um, next up, we have uh, Lily Pollens. Thank you. Um, it is a real privilege to be here. Um, I'm an urban planner, and from this vantage point, I view the coronavirus pandemic as a natural disaster. Um, and like most natural disasters, its impacts are unequally distributed. This, um, and specifically, I mean um, unequally distributed within the city, because we've already heard a little bit about how it's unequally distributed um, among cities. Uh, but this une uneven impact is not natural at all. It has been manufactured by enduring institutions like racialized policies, half a century of neoliberal disinvestment in public infrastructure, an exploitative economic system. This political economy imposes the highest costs of the pandemic on the most vulnerable and allows the most protected to carry on, albeit in more stressful circumstances. Um, so many of us on this panel spend a lot of time thinking about this kind of uneven vulnerability in the climate changed urban world. And when we use that term, we're almost always talking about the vulnerability of individuals and communities. But the point I would like to raise today is that in moments of crisis, we also need to consider the vulnerability of urban planning and governing institutions. Urban planning has not always served the interests of the most at-risk publics, but a new generation of urban plans and policy frameworks offers a potential avenue towards more just and resilient cities, cities in which future natural disasters might not have such devastating and unequal impacts um, as, as the pandemic we are currently experiencing. Um, recently adopted city plans and policy res resolutions from New York, from Los Angeles, Seattle, and other cities around the country acknowledge the structural link between environmental degradation and economic inequality and direct city governments to work towards economic and environmental justice simultaneously. In practice, these plans and policies advocate for investment in non-fossil fuel dependent infrastructure, for green job creation, and for equitable climate change adaptation. These policy initiatives are not entirely radical, but they have institutionalized a new vision of what a just and resilient city could look like. For many cities, including New York, the coronavirus is the first major test of these plans and policies. Can the ideas and the organizations that have elevated them withstand the shock of the coronavirus and its attendant recession? The answer to this question will be a strong signal about how ready cities actually are to manage the unfolding long arc of the climate crisis. Um, of course, it's impossible to actually answer this question from within the heat of the emergency, but I want to offer three preliminary observations. First, we are seeing an organized deployment of disaster capitalism. For those unfamiliar with this concept, it is how Naomi Klein describes the practice of corporate interests exploiting public anxiety during an emergency to advance private agendas. One small example of this from my work, city and state governments are rolling back plastic bag bans as plastic and fossil fuel lobbyists convince policymakers that reusable bags represent a public health threat. Now these same lobbyists have been making this claim for a very long time, but in the context of COVID it has found traction. Um, and 
these new decisions will result in long-term environmental consequences. Disaster capitalism is evident in many other sectors as well and represents a threat to the urban institutions that advocate for resilience and fairness. Um, second, the plastic policy rollback and other regulatory responses to the virus are happening without any public input. In general, the pandemic has accelerated a troubling trend towards diminished public participation. This is not because people have lost interest, as we saw, um, as we have seen in recent elections, um, but rather because dominant political forces have actively sought to limit participation as a way to fast track unpopular policy decisions. Um, my third concern, cities have relatively few options for raising revenues. Um, without federal and state aid, cities are being forced to slash municipal budgets, meaning that cities will not be able to invest in new urban infrastructure and more just urban systems. In the context of the richest country on earth, even in the midst of a recession, fiscal austerity is a choice that lays bare political priorities. As has happened many times before, state and federal governments can weaponize austerity, forcing cities to reinvest in old systems, prop up existing power structures, and diminish our chances for mitigating and adapting to climate change. Austerity could undermine recent urban commitments to environmental and economic justice. But I do think it's crucial to note that alongside disaster capitalism and austerity and democratic suppression, I also see many signals that cities are not planning to roll over and give up on their visions. First and foremost, I see robust civil society networks quietly building capacity over Zoom. Organizations from neighborhood environmental justice groups to the global climate movement are getting ready to fight hard against returning to a dangerous pre-pandemic quote unquote normal. I also see public and elected officials in many cities attuned to inequality in ways that are unusual in public discourse. City officials all over the country are publicly confronting homelessness, hunger, and the digital divide. Their efforts are imperfect, of course, but as we see on Twitter every single day, discourse is powerful. It will be incumbent upon all of us to collectively hold our cities accountable. Um, maybe I should say our governments accountable to the commitments that we have made to build resilient, just, post-normal cities. Thank you. Great, thank you, Lily. Okay, so moving through the panel, we'll go to uh, Mark Pelling next. And uh, Mark, I'm not sure you were formally introduced as from King's College London, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll just throw that into the mix as well. Ah, thanks very much, Bill. Um, and uh, thanks already for the, the panelists have spoken, Re really appreciated their contributions. So it's a pleasure certainly to be here this afternoon and talk with you all. Uh, my background to introduce myself a little further is as an urban social researcher with a focus on pro-poor resilience and adaptation in the face of climate change and other natural hazards. I've mainly worked in Latin America and the Caribbean, more recently in Sub-Saharan Africa and a little bit also in London. The key message that I'd like to get across today is the need to act now, even during response, to bring resilience more centrally into the everyday decisions that shape urban development. History from past disaster events shows us that without a clearly articulated vision, a political movement for an alternative, and practical steps for action, those with power before a disaster will concentrate control post-disaster. This can be seen at the city level very often where temporary housing becomes permanent and land grabs transfer ownership away from local and low or middle income residents to extractive or predatory capital and also globally. COVID-19 has done a good job at highlighting opportunities for change in urban systems that can bring resilience from investing to reverse trends towards high density, low, low service housing to enhancing capacity in public health and social care systems. A more resilient form of economy is already emerging with a temporary move away from just-in-time manufacturing and major shifts towards practices that reinforce resilience, stockpiles, redundant capacity, duplicated systems, and so on. Actions that bring and begin to rebalance the emphasis between resilience and efficiency. But above all, it's the quest for efficiency that continues to leave us vulnerable. This is not a new consideration. The financial crisis taught us that banks needed much bigger buffers, but few carried the lesson over into other institutions such as hospitals or public health. Rather, 
What COVID-19 is showing us is a repeated inability to act. That systems do not become more resilient in recovery, more likely and especially for public sector responsibilities and those with least resources to buffer themselves against shocks, resilience diminishes with each shock. There's a knee-jerk action away from resilience even when this is shown wanting. In the UK, for example, we ran a pandemic planning exercise in October 2016. Exercise Cygnus, as it was called, showed that should there be a future pandemic, there'd be insufficient doctors, emergency beds, ventilators and protective equipment in the UK. While the expense of excess capacity in doctors and hospital space is understandable, spare capacity in protective equipment is harder to understand unless seen as part of a wider systemic rejection of resilience whenever it challenges efficiency, even at the margins. So what role can science play in making it easier for decision makers to choose resilience as a basis, not competitor for development and through this into sustainability? From my own small perspective, there is an opportunity, even responsibility for science to provide the data and convening spaces for decision makers to reconsider the relationship between resilience and efficiency in their priorities and planning. And one way to support this is through more inclusive decision making. To close then, uh, a quick example of this from our own work in Nairobi, Kenya, through a project called Tomorrow Cities. Here and over the next four years, we'll be working with city government and organized slum dwellers to co-develop urban regeneration to reduce risk from multiple hazards. The arrival of COVID-19 has allowed us to build on this. We've worked with local organizations to map out social interventions from hand washing stations to food dispersal points and information broadcasts. This is important in filling gaps left by a weak state, but for the longer term, it gives confidence in the slums where trust in government is weak. It makes it more difficult to scapegoat the urban poor for spreading the disease. And it positions slum leaders to have a voice in recovery and renewal, even as impacts and response unfold. A small action, but one that contributes to the case being made to help push international as well as national and city level policy towards investment in basic services to build resilience and enable sustainable development. So like some of the other presenters, I'm presenting a positive story. In some quarters, there is political and popular desire to do things differently. We can identify blockages that have forced resilience to the margins and identify mechanisms to bring resilience to the fore. But there is an urgency to this agenda. If COVID-19 is to avoid being yet another missed opportunity for wrestling sustainability away from the global crisis. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Okay, um, fourth panelist, Kizzy Charles Guzman. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, the COVID crisis has painfully laid bare uh, the inequalities of our society. Um, in New York City, uh, which is the epicenter of our crisis, um, COVID-related deaths are highest in low-income neighborhoods and those that are predominantly communities of color. We expect that similar patterns would emerge across the world as immigrant communities, low-income families that live in multi-generational and congregate housing, and those without consistent access to housing, running water, air conditioning, and economic security are more greatly impacted. These areas are facing another looming threat. As the summertime heat season approaches, the COVID crisis is on a collision course with the climate crisis. That means that the same communities that are already reeling from unprecedented tragedy and suffering are the same ones that face the highest risks from extreme heat. So I want to focus on heat as a case study. In a typical summer, uh, local governments operate cooling centers and advise people to seek air-conditioned spaces such as movie theaters, malls, public libraries, as a way of preventing heat-related illnesses and death. However, as long as shelter-in-place orders remain in effect, 
opening cooling centers and recreational facilities and offering outdoor cooling options for those that are most vulnerable would be impossible or at least very uh, cost prohibitive to do so safely. And as more families face economic insecurity, the same policies will force a hard choice between buying food or cooling their homes to stay safe. That means that vulnerable Americans, New Yorkers, will be weathering high temperatures at home where they may or may not have access to air conditioning. So a perspective I want to add today is that while some see air conditioner as a luxury, it is a lifeline. And in fact, it is life supporting medical equipment for a great percentage of our population. Without it, indoor temperatures can be up to 20 degrees higher than outdoors. In fact, in New York City, 85% of the heat stroke deaths that we see um, on average every summer happen during exposure at home. And in many cases, that is because the cost of owning and operating an air conditioning unit is simply too high. In New York City and New York State, we already see increases of hospital admissions for renal, respiratory, and cardiovascular conditions during periods of extreme heat. Many of the same people who are heat vulnerable are also at risk for serious COVID-19 illness, including older adults and those with underlying chronic conditions. Mirroring patterns in COVID-19 morbidity and mortality, heat-related deaths rates in New York City are associated with race and poverty, with Latino Black residents at disproportionate risk. A severe heat wave during this pandemic could present a substantial risk. As more families experience economic insecurity and unemployment continues to skyrocket globally because of COVID-19, more residents are expected to cut their budgets where they can and forego home cooling, which only increases their risk of heat illness and death. And this situation could be alleviated with government-funded air conditioning distribution programs and small grants towards life-saving cooling utility costs. Why am I sharing this case study? is because I want to highlight that we often see this conversation co-opted by people who are raising concerns about the sustainability or ability to add air conditioners to our electrical grid, leading to increased energy use and their related greenhouse gas emissions. The fact is that even if social distancing guidelines are eased, serious concerns about cooling centers will remain. It is very easy to imagine these facilities becoming incubators for the virus if social distancing practices aren't strictly followed. And again, to make matters worse, those who typically visit cooling centers are exactly the same populations most vulnerable to the virus, the elderly, the poor, and those with pre-existing health conditions. So if Americans can't go to public pools and gather at beaches and open up fire hydrants on a street for groups of children, or even visiting a local cooling center to beat the heat, we have to meet them where they are, and that is at home. So the last thought I wanna leave with you is that we should question the ethics of proposing that our climate and sustainability goals should be met by sacrificing the lives of the world's poorest and most vulnerable residents. I would propose that applying an equity framework to climate adaptation work means that we target the real energy hogs the commercial office buildings that overcool offices and leave their lights on all night. And instead of grandma uh, who lives in the fifth story walk up apartment and is baking because her electricity system cannot support a window AC. So yes, let's support policies that spur innovation of that decades old technology that is air conditioning. Uh, let's support efforts to uh, support our, our, um, our grid resiliency. But I would say that sustainability and efficiency goals are only worthy if we're not also ignoring the needs of our most vulnerable communities. So yes, cities must plan for how the COVID-19 pandemic response intersects with heat emergencies, which are possible as early as May. But I would propose that we do so with an equitable lens to recognize the inherent classism and racism that underpins our current policies as we blame density for inequitable health outcomes versus focusing on why we see overcrowding in those communities, which is a matter of affordability. So yes, equity focused policies are much needed. Keeping home school will keep Americans out of public places and prevent transmission of the virus. It will also save lives in some of our hardest hit communities. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you so much. So um, we've heard 
uh, four different perspectives, obviously some interconnections between them, but also sort of laying out different groundwork for sort of looking at this question of the connection between the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, cities, and this question of climate change. What we want to do at this point is to sort of give the panelists an opportunity to sort of cross-connect, reflect on what their other uh, panelists, or the co-panelists, uh, panel members have said, um, and to ask questions either for clarification or uh, elaboration uh, for a few minutes. And then um, audience, please be uh, thinking about questions as well. We'll turn to you shortly there after that. Um, any, uh, any panelists want to sort of um, uh, either ask questions, uh, elaboration or clarification? Well, this is all good. This is very good. All right. I think maybe um, you've, you've had the opportunity, obviously, to sort of connect. And I think one of the things that, um, as any good panel will always say, the most rewarding part of the discussion is to sort of connect with the audience. Um, so why don't we sort of move to that directly? Um, the process is to sort of uh, put some questions into um, the Q&A um, option within the Zoom, and then those will be collated and um, uh, brought forward uh, to me and I'll sort of present them. And we have one, um, um, first uh, we have actually um, someone who's gonna actually speak uh, her question, Ma um, uh, Marcella, Marcella, sorry, Marcella Tovar. Um, uh, maybe we can have the question come forward or the uh, questioner come forward. Thank you to all the panelists for the great presentations. I'm an urban planner working on intersectionality and gender issues and climate change. Um, the pandemic has made evidence the importance of health and its connection to care and the care economy. As we know, uh, care work is made basically by women through paid and unpaid work. Uh, the question is, is this the right moment to highlight the question about health, sustainability and care as a gender intersectional main issue in the climate change agenda? We lost you a little bit toward the very end, but the reference obviously was toward the question of gender and, and equity within that. Do the panelists feel like uh, anyone respond? Um, and feel, feel free to respond. I think Mark is uh, either at an auction or, or raising uh, <laughs> wants to respond. Yes, I'll have two of those. Um, yeah, couldn't agree agree more. Like like many of many crises, it's it is gendered and intersectional as well. Just. Uh, I mean, a couple of reflections from the from the UK, certainly not just within the care sector, but life at home, rates of gender based violence have really skyrocketed. And I'm, I'm sure that's also uh, applies to children in vulnerable situations as well, um, especially as those children are unable to attend school, which is often a place where their, you know, their conditions are monitored if they're if they're vulnerable. But particularly on your question, there's been a a response of late to the way in which um, healthcare professionals, who often are women, have been presented in the media. Um, and there's been a sort of vocabulary around uh, soldiers and warfare. And we've had quite a few healthcare professionals dying. Um, and considering this, there's, there's a great deal of concern for their families as well. Um, the, using, using this language of, of uh, of, of warfare and dying has kind of has been resisted and the healthcare professionals are saying that they're, they're not soldiers they're professionals seeking to care who are being put at risk because governments have not or the UK government has not sought to invest in protective equipment so this isn't a choice and the narrative around this has 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 shifted from what could have been a strong political narrative towards an almost sort of a romanticization of the risk that healthcare professionals are placing themselves under. So yeah, I just wanted to flag that from the UK perspective, it's, it's important and it's this, it just is a great example of the way in which the opportunity that COVID could open for progressive social change is being in some ways perhaps unwittingly distorted by the media uh, using tropes that are, are taking away from the politics and resting on a more sort of romantic vision of, of risk, thanks. Um, I think we'll, 
unless there's another panelist who wants to speak to it directly, I think maybe Lily, uh, just a short response and then we'll go on to, to get as many questions as we can. Um, I just wanted to add quickly, it, it looks like maybe we've lost Kizzy, but I see a connection between her comments about the, you know, the particular risks of um, the, uh, the COVID pandemic lasting through the summer and potential heat waves and just the, the you know, of, women tend to do more um, homework and care work in just, you know, dispersed locations as well. So I just, um, I think, I think to respond directly to Marcella's question, it's absolutely crucial that we bring that, the, these kind of intersectional vulnerability indicators, including gender, to the conversation together. Great, thank you. So we have another um, question coming from uh, Partha Deb. Um, do you want to please bring your question forward? I think you're on mute at the moment. Yep. Yes. Uh, thanks, Bill, and thanks to the panelists. Uh, this has been fantastic. I'm uh, a professor of economics at Hunter College and the department chair. Um, and I figured uh, this would be more interesting than a lot of other stuff I'm doing right now. So <laughs> thank you all. Um, my, my question is the, the tension that I see between policy that works for the developed world versus policy that works for the developing world. Uh, I think, I think COVID-19 and this pandemic kind of, at least in my opinion, highlights even that. But one, a distinction that I think is often lost. So I'll, I'll just give you kind of the, that, that beautiful image of the India gate. I'm Indian. I mean, it's fantastic. I don't remember the last time it was as clean as that. But the way that happened was, millions of migrants were sent home, right? That, that was part of the reason it looked so beautiful. And maybe it's even in the worst case scenario in the US, in New York City, and I kind of agree there are lots of people hurting real bad, but, but it's just not in the same scale. So potentially that means policy differences need to be front and center, what works as a policy response in New York, in the US, uh, is probably not the right policy response for India, for Sierra Leone, for uh, Sudan, where it's going to happen in similar ways. So I, I would love your reactions to that. Great question. So the tension between different sort of context for response. Um, I know many of the folks here might be able to pick that up, that question up. Maybe, um, Mark, I know that's, you've sort of phrased it in that context. I'll maybe point to you, or Sully. Um, I know sure. both of you are oh, Go ahead, Sully. I've already spoken. Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, I was just going to reflect on, we, we, we have some work in, in Nairobi that I mentioned, but, but also in, uh, in the Middle East and it's it's interesting there that there's a sense of um, of being able to manage the virus, um, which is which seems rather unworldly, and uh, there's a in some cities there's a there's a calmness even in some of the squatter settlements, and that calmness is being disrupted by a politics that can be quite violent. You've mentioned India, and of course there are many stories that are quite um increasing and and the same can be said in, in uh, about a month ago uh for about curfew time so so you know there is an opportunity for police and other interests to use this event to do things that they might not be able to do otherwise including extracting the poor from cities and who knows how they'll return and in what guise and shape uh, so those are real concerns i think as was mentioned as well by by others there's a lack of oversight, openness, transparency in policy and practice during what are called emergency phases. And the COVID offers a, a, quite an open-ended emergency phase, potentially. Um, although in, in cities of the global south, when it, when it does arrive, I guess there's a prospect that the impacts will be, uh, will be shorter and more brutal than in the global north because of a lack of abilities to, to self-protect. In that context, certainly in Nairobi, one sees fantastic work going on um, from providing water uh, to information education to advise home learning and so on so it's it is despite 
the, the sort of isolation that comes with formal policy around COVID-19, still uh, social collective action is unfolding in those cities. And I think the opportunity then is to raise that up to a visibility within public policy. So it's seen not just as reactive, but as part of an unfolding ability of the urban four uh, that haven't been moved on to, to contribute to urban policy. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to comment on this as well, Bill. It's okay. Yep. Uh, it, perhaps a couple of uh, uh, responses to what you were saying. Developing countries for many years, this looks very much like a developing country response to me. Uh, it's very, it's uh, lacking uh, national policy. Sure, it has the science, but the science in a way is international. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing now is, again, the inability uh, of uh, the international community to come together to deal with this as a global pandemic, uh, which it is. So in a way, the, the benefits that should flow to the less developed countries are not flowing as well as they could if we had a stronger World Health Organization, if we had stronger transfers of knowledge, technology, resources to developing countries, we see a kind of a reduction of interest uh, of uh, the more developed countries, particularly the US, in what is happening elsewhere. This kind of America first thing is actually astonishing to me. It's the first time that I see America not even trying to lead uh, in an international uh, pandemic. Now, having said that, I do agree with you that uh, less developed countries are going to be less able uh, to deal with this pandemic insofar as the only thing that we've been able to do now is social distancing. Okay, so we are not going to be able to do as good social distancing as we did in uh, more developed countries. And um, uh, then with more chances of over overwhelming their weak health systems. Uh, I don't see it yet happening. And as Mark has said, it may be that the response we're going to get there is weaker uh, uh, than we did in uh, places like the US. That the, that the, the virus, uh, will not have the same uh, peaks that it has in some places in the United States. I have no evidence for that, but it looks to me like the, the numbers are not there yet. Uh, is it, are they going to come later? I don't know. Okay. Great, thank you. Did any other panelists, I would like to sort of, um, I'm already sort of sensing the, the, the question of, of time starting to, to limit our perspective. So I want to, I do want to make sure panelists have opportunities to respond, but I also want to take in some, some more questions. So let me get, take another question um, next to uh, Mariana Polovskaya. And then uh, follow, following that, we have two other uh, questioners in the queue. So uh, Mariana. Oh, Sorry, okay, now I, um, I can hear you. Well, thank you so much for such a stimulating discussion. I really appreciate a variety of perspectives. Um, I am myself a geographer, hu human urban geographer, uh, chair of the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at Hunter College. And my latest research was uh, proceeding around um, solidarity economy and also kind of trying to think about um, ecological resilience as uh, a simultaneous progression towards social sustainability. So after all this crisis, how are we going to end up with a better society? And my question more specifically is that um, you are um, really um, was talking about this relationship between uh, climate crisis, COVID crisis, and economic structures. So my question, I just want to push it a little uh, forward, a little more. If climate crisis is a result of how we have been running our economy, 
and its impacts and impacts of COVID crisis differ, differ along lines of class and race and gender, how can we achieve resilience without looking into causes of the crisis? And which also in some ways reflects, thank you, uh, Mark's points about resilience and, and challenge. Mm -hmm. So responses. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll just say, I think it's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I mean, my, my position is we can't. Um, I don't think we can. I don't think we can get there unless we fundamentally examine the structure of the economy, um, you know, the structure of our, the way that we, of our production um, systems. Um, so I think that's why um, I see a lot of hope in these kind of new urban plans, which are more kind of radical in their orientation um, and take on questions about structural connections between um, environmental degradation and social inequality. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's one reason that we have to really nurture those plans and make sure that we invest in them. Okay. Any other sort of specific responses? Otherwise, we'll bring in another question. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll take another question and then we can sort of do this as sort of an additive uh, fashion. I think um, the next question is from uh, Cynthia Rosenzweig. Is she available? I think you're on mute. Yep. Yes. I'm, uh, hello. Uh, thank you to Hunter and Bill and the panelists um, for, for really a wonderful and very thoughtful panel. Uh, Bill and I are co-directors of the Urban Climate Change Research Network with a thousand researchers in cities around the world. And my question is to all the panelists to help us seize the moment as researchers. What would you, each of you say, to, it's a two part question. One is what is the, what would you say is the key research topic uh, that, um, that you would, what would be your number one? Of course it's many and has to be many, many things, but just uh, interested in your, your, each of your, what is your, what, what, what is the biggest thing and the most important research area to um, encourage researchers to do. That's the first part. The second part is how do we go forward in the research practice that Mark was talking about with the co-generation? What are the secrets to making that co-generated research happen so that we can truly move to create this uh, momentum to actually uh, seize the moment and, and have the transformation at scale that's needed? Thank you. Great. Maybe uh, if Kizzy, if you're, um, I know you've had video issues, but maybe we could turn to you first on this question about, um, you know, the research question, because in some ways I think embedded in, in, in the question is a recognition of knowledge that has application and sort of connecting, you know, research not in the, maybe folks would respond in its purest sense, but also with the idea of application. So maybe we'll go to you first, Kizzy, just short responses by the four panelists, and then we'll sort of uh, move forward through that. So maybe Kizzy, a response? Sure. Um, I, I uh, Just to go back to the example of heat, um, one of the questions that al we always come back to is our inability to uh, secure the needed funding, right, to protect uh, vulnerable communities and everyone at large and to invest in adaptation planning. Because just compared to a climate risk like flooding, where it is just a more visual uh, risk, right? Um, during a heat wave, your house looks the same, and after the heat wave, the house looks the same, but you have before and after pictures of a coastal storm. And that is quite a jarring image and it allows us to tell a story about risk. Uh, it allows us to convey our, our scientific understanding, right, um, uh, to the public and to decision makers as to why we need to make certain investments in flood mitigation, for example. Um, so I think that part of the research that um, I would love to see happen is, um, you know, the, the, the risks of other climate risks beyond coastal flooding um, are harder to interpret, uh, both at the community scale um, and at the um, it, and in terms of the interventions that are needed, right? And so the effectiveness of the interventions that we need, um, where is there innovation for those interventions to be done more sustainably? Um, but also, what are the disparate community impacts um, of other types of climate risk? I think it's always something that comes back up to us. Everybody needs to see, um, you know, how it is that communities are coping with other climate risks, and 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 it, that is harder to do for some versus others. Great. Okay. Thank you. 
other panelists, so in terms of like the key research question and, and sort of mechanisms to affect it, Sully. Yeah. Yes, um, the key research question uh, that I see is that we have a natural experiment being conduct conducted right now where the output measures are available. Namely, there is a pandemic and some cities are being hit harder than others. And some communities are being hit harder than others. The question is why? Why will some cities be able to uh, weather this storm better than other places? Because I think that that is where we learn what makes a difference when we are confronted with something like that kind of pandemic. Perfect. Lily, your remark to respond to the key question? Yeah. Um, just just quickly, I think I see a, um, an interesting connection here with um, the question from Professor Partha from a few minutes ago. Um, the question about, you know, do we, are solutions in the global north appropriate in the global south? Um, one thing that I actually feel like we should be considering more is how to, for the global north should be learning from the global south instead of the other way around. Um, particularly when we're thinking about um, infrastructure and governance mechanisms that are more distributed and less centralized, less reliant on kind of a strong state. Um, I think we're seeing right now in places like New York that we need that too. Um, and there's a lot of knowledge elsewhere that I think researchers, I mean, I think we should just invert our, our you know, typical research questions a little bit mm. to acknowledge that. I've heard variations of that same, you know, the, the flexibility of, a, of an urban system such as New York versus one you know, I mean, in Mark, your area of work um, in, you know, informal settlements in the, in the Sub-Saharan Africa, um, very different, very sort of maybe flexible is not the right word, but I don't know, did you want to speak to that point or your key research question that, that you see? Thanks, Bill. So <clears throat> I suppose I, I, I see the biggest questions outside of my expertise to some extent. Those are where I see, you know, the big the big gap and for me it would be structural macro scale economics and politics institutional behavior incentive structures holding to account global international agencies political movements and so on um, i think science has tended to do social science anyway to do a, a good job and been drawn towards easy access points for partnership so that takes it towards civil society the urban poor and perhaps secondary data analysis and of course, it's much more difficult to, to gain traction with those that really hold power. Um, but so, so that to me is, is the research gap and uh, that might require some quite, quite novel uh, ways around thinking about research that might indeed need to draw on arts and humanities as part of the communication strategy. Um, but certainly you mentioned co-production and uh, for me as an applied researcher, um, that's just central, I think, to any research that is going to contribute in the direct way and hold the urgency of the climate crisis, let alone COVID-19. Research does need to be co-designed with those that can take that research up. And it's not just about data transfer, and uh, it, it's also about the convening power of research. So the possibility, certainly we try to use in the global south of bringing together through enabling slum dwellers who often have more knowledge than, than we do and technical skills as well, to have that skill recognized in a panel or board or co-project with city government. So at the end of the little project, still there is this relationship between the urban poor who are recognized as having something technical to say. So it is a leveling of a hierarchy of power that leads to the opening of a new conversation around policy and tries to get past us, at least if you can, a kind of competitive dialogue, um, which is too entrenched. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank all for the panelists. So we are uh, running um, you know, into the time. And what I want to do now, we have at least three questions, sort of um, uh, questioners queued up. I'm going to ask um, each of the questioners to sort of bring forward their question to make sure that the panelists hear them. And then for the remaining minutes of the, the panel, uh, we'll let the panelists respond and then we'll do a quick closing. Um, so first up, we'll have, we'll have three. We'll have uh, Franco Montalto first, then Derek Thompson to ask his question, and then uh, Bob Chen. So Franco, uh, you first, please, and then we'll move on to the other two. 
there, Bill. Uh, thanks, and thanks to all the panelists. This has been a great session. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I just am thinking forward to the eventual post-COVID stimulus and the opportunity that it represents to marry those who are principally concerned about the economic imp impact of COVID with those of us who are in, you know, interested on the sort of uh, inequality, sustainability, climate, I'll just sort of lump those together, impacts of the, of the same pandemic. And I was just wondering, so we heard information uh, uh, you know, about, you know, Sally talking about the impacts on public transit, and Lily talking about, for example, you know, I would sort of lump together the, the plastic ban, plastic bag bans in the context of zero, zero waste, the impact on zero waste. And from Kizzy, we heard about uh, air conditioners. So how, I, I was just interested in some specific examples of how, what the panelists would like to see in the post-COVID stimulus to push those areas in the right direction. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Franco. Okay, so uh, next we have a question from uh, Derek Thompson, I believe. Yep. Derek, please, a quick question. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Derek Thomas. Uh, Thomas, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Thomas. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, I've been reading a lot about the sort of Dutch proposal that has gone viral, put forth by academics, um, in which they're sort of rejecting this idea of return in nor returning to normal, uh, in which negative sort of environmental and public health consequences of our ever increasing objective of, of profit driven economic growth uh, outstrips the benefits of that growth and diminishes our lives and ultimately puts us in a position where we're constantly uh, responding to an emergencies instead of being prepared for these emergencies. So I'm just wondering if you're familiar with that proposal and if you have sort of any thoughts on how a city such as New York can adopt um, such an approach. Great, thanks, Derek. In some ways, that sort of refl reflects nicely to what uh, Franco has asked. So it's great to bundle those two. So uh, a next question um, uh, would be from Bob Chen, and then Bob, after you finish your question, I'm going to put it back to the panelists to sort of uh, both uh, reflect, you know, collectively on their responses, but also as they think about that, think about maybe potential policy um, uh, recommendations, uh, you know, moving forward as well. And then I'll close us down about one minute before for time. But Bob, uh, turning to you for your question, uh, please. Okay, thanks, uh, Bill, and hi to everybody. Um, I think way at the beginning, Shlomo kind of put this as a urban versus rural kind of context. And uh, uh, so I was thinking about, you know, the focus of the discussion on mostly on the urban areas. But I think we're seeing, you know, some of the, interconnectedness, uh, things like the food chain, where, uh, you know, it's clear that the cities can have done as well as they've done without that food chain all the way from, from rural areas into the urban, and vice versa, we have rural areas experiencing impacts, you know, throwing milk out and stuff, because their markets have, have uh, been disrupted. So, um, and then we've also seen differences between states and, uh, you know, metro areas and, and their surroundings in their response. So I'm just curious how, how you would uh, uh, think about this, uh, you know, more cooperation, coordination happening as things open up um, and what the role of, you know, both regional and, and national leadership in, is in sort of bridging this urban rural uh, divide. Thanks, Bob. In some ways, that question also reflects this sort of very kind of fundamental point about shocks and stressors, which they reveal, you know, all these underlying issues. I mean, sort of embedded in our conversation today, there's been this sort of sense that, you know, COVID-19 as a, as, a, as, a, as a crisis sort of revealed these um, instabilities, these inequities, these tensions, the, rur the rural urban, but also poses another thread that I heard is opportunity. It, it brought forward you know, these ideas, and I sort of introduced at the very beginning that this is the kinds of conversations that need to have happen to happen if we can seize opportunity. Um, both Franco's questions sort of talked about a post-19, uh, COVID-19 world. How do we sort of, you know, facilitate that, that opportunity? And then uh, Derek brought forward the example of, of the Dutch sort of uh, academic approach of like, 
you know, overtly, uh, explicitly stating that we can't go back and being much more um, sort of um, uh, kind of clearly stated on it. So I'm gonna give it back to you guys to sort of um, close and, and sort of reflect on those points for a few minutes. Uh, apologies that we only literally have that, um, but whomever would like to respond, I'd be more than happy to kind of have you start and then um, maybe cycle through quickly. Sure. Um, okay, uh, just to address just one little piece of Franco's pro uh, question. Thank you for that, and it's really insightful. I just want to put the bug in everyone's ear that um, the Home Energy Assistance Program is a federally funded but state administered grant program uh, that helps low income people pay for their winter utility heating bills and provides very limited cooling assistance funding for the summer. Uh, but as part of the CARES Act, um, there was a, uh, an additional $900 million in additional uh, LIHEAP funds for states. Um, and so a, a key question of that is, okay, let's, uh, let's start to think about not only uh, the states that need it the most, um, that are these hotspots, getting a fair share of that funding, but also let's look at the state level, right? And what are the rules that are in place that specifically exclude key populations? So for example, in New York State, heat can be used to purchase and install air conditioners, but not to offset utility costs. There's also a very difficult application process that includes submitting a note of medical necessity, which creates a barrier at this particular time, right, uh, for residents that might be concerned about infection, uh, but also it bur further burdens the healthcare system. So again, these are just rules that exist in the states and that we can easily advocate for changing. Lastly, our heat program in New York State does not cover all who need it because they specifically exclude public housing residents and those that utilize um, housing vouchers, federal housing vouchers. So again, it's really this confluence of thinking about there is some funding and sometimes the rules are the ones that are creating this inequity. So how can we really think through the advocacy strategy that is needed to really target our state and federal government? It's not just a matter of asking for more money, but making sure that that funding is equitable and has public health as the underpinning uh, perspective in how we spend those dollars. Great, any, uh, Sully, yep. Yes, um, let me focus on only one small part of it, uh, but an important one, and that is the part about governance and the bankruptcy of governance when it comes to how to handle this uh, pandemic. And uh, I want to talk only about two aspects of this government governance issue in the context of cities. First of all, this is another wonderful illustration of why metropolitan areas are at the core of this uh, pandemic. And we don't have metropolitan governance to deal with this issue. And that is we're still, uh, have metropolitan areas that are divide, divided among states. Uh, we don't have any, it, you know, the governor of New York starts to talk about metropolitan, co about coordination with New Jersey and with um, Connecticut because there is no organization that can take care of the, if the New York metropolitan area. So the first thing is that this, this should strengthen our resolve to create metropolitan structures uh, to combat these kind of uh, issues, uh, which we've neglected to do. The second part, uh, similar to that, is that this has exposed uh, the total imbalance between our public sector and our private sector, and that we've weakened the public sector to an unacceptable, unacceptable degree, where everything is privatized where you don't know how to kind of bring these tests together, bring these equipments together. There are 200 private hospitals that you have to deal with in order to co coordinate that. So I think that uh, over the last few decades, we've weakened that public sector and it's, uh, its raison d'etre, its legitimacy, its budgets. And this is really, is really telling us that we've gone too far and we have to start walking back to an earlier period where the public sector could really do things properly. Yeah, great comment. I guess I would also push on to that a little bit and maybe sort of thinking about Mark's perspective in my head a little bit. You know, you mentioned the back, I think also forward and, and other people have said, how do you actually create, you know, uh, 
a, a, a new vibrant public sector? Is the old model the one we want to choose or is there a different model out there? That's you know, a, a question. So um, Mark and to Lily, uh, closing thoughts and reflections on the questions or you know, other elements you want to bring forward. We, we're, we've gone over about a, a minute now. We have about another couple of minutes to go, but uh, just want to give you. I'm happy to let Lily have the last word as, as the local. <laughs> um, but so just a thought on, right, perhaps building on, on, on the last comments, I guess from, from a European perspective as well. So one seeing the, the legitimacy of the state in terms of what reconstruction response might look like, really relying upon science, upon the strength of the public sector, especially public health systems, and on popular will uh, to conform to social distancing without heavy policing. So that paints, a, to some way, perhaps a positive picture of where the, the authority lies, the legitimacy lies for drawing the future. If it lies more within science, more within public sector, more within a, an engaged citizenry uh, and population. So if that can be harnessed, then we have quite an opportunity, even in the coming recession, to recast the way in which government and the private sector sit. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mark. Lily, uh, quick comment, um, apologies, and then I'll make a quick end comment. Thank you. Um, I guess just really, really quickly um, to sort of some of the issues that were raised in the questions. My, you know, my initial instinct is, well, let's read the uh, new Los Angeles just passed a Green New Deal for Los Angeles. New York City's um, current city plan um, is basically a, a Green New Deal plan. And these are really concrete, specific documents that lay out a really plausible path forward if there are resources. So I guess my, um, I mean, they're not, they're not perfect. I have a lot of critiques, but in general, I, I see them as really um, holding a lot of potential. Um, so I guess if I have one policy recommendation or kind of concluding thought, it's a like Green New Deal. Okay, excellent, very good. Well, with that, let me um, say a couple of uh, quick comments, and then we'll close down the discussion. As I started the the the, uh, the panel, you know, really what we look at is a set of of ideas, a set of emergent questions. We've we've seen the 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 early implications of what COVID nineteen does to urban life, and the and already a, a kind of a beginning, you know, a debate has has taken place uh, within the media and other sort of uh, outlets about the implications of this for cities. For the for for all of, of of city life, and I think one of the things that we sort of need to to reflect on is that this is part of a of a long discussion that now needs to take place. This is the hard work, you know, that we have to do. That everyone has hard work in this in this challenge. We see the people who go to the hospitals every day experiencing hard work. This is our hard work, as much as we can call it as such, to debate and to push and to engage and to bring forward the science that will bring forward um, new and better action with respect to um, cities and the daily life of the people within it. So we've begun the conversation. Um, there were hundreds of people on this, this, this uh, uh, panel. Hopefully that will spirit other, other conversations um, to move this agenda forward. So again, I wanna thank everybody um, the panelists and the Roosevelt House folks for, for, for organizing. Um, thanks again as well. We want to sort of keep in mind that there are other events and other activities that, that the Roosevelt House group um, have been preparing. It's been uh, this particular event will, um, has been filmed and will be available and, um, and translatable uh, you know, for, uh, for review and other contexts. Um, but with that, I want to thank everybody, um, thank the panelists. Um, and uh, to be continued. Um, this is a, a struggle that, that, has, that has been ongoing. The COVID-19 punctuated some of these issues and it will something that we can carry forward. And I think I wanna leave with the best notion of the, op the word opportunity. Um, we have a window, now we have to seize that. Thank, thank you all. Take care. Thank you.